Thank you for that song tonight. Think about the message that's in that song to each one of us. That's a real blessing. Amen. We thank the Lord for that. All right. If you have your Bibles tonight, we'll back up here just a few verses in the second chapter, and then we'll go into chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. And as we've studied so far about the Individuals who were involved in the book of Ruth, uh, Elimelech, and realizing they were there in Moab, and they had gone there because of a famine. And if you study your Bible, the Bible teaches in seven times throughout the Old Testament were that God's way of judging Israel and, the, and the, his people his chosen people, I should say, was when they disallowed God or paid no attention to what God had said and didn't follow his instruction, well, a famine came. That was God's way of getting their attention. And so apparently this is what happened during the time when uh, Elimelech took his family and went into Moab, and uh, he must have been uh, uh, destitute. Uh, for food or to be able to uh, feed his family, take care of them. I don't know all the circumstances, and the Bible doesn't really tell us in detail, but at any rate, there was a couple of things that he could have done that the Bible didn't mention, and one of those was the fact he could have, uh, the property by which he, that he had possession of, because God divided that property up to, uh, each tribe, and then those within that tribe were given a portion of land, and uh, so he he could have had the opportunity to have mortgaged that property until the year of jubilee, or if need be, he could actually sell himself into slavery, 
and that way he could provide for his family, but he didn't do either one of those according to the Bible. He took his family and went down to Moab. So we know that's the situation as it stands. We also know that God was working in the providence of God uh, with Ruth and uh, Naomi, uh, who became very close to each other. And uh, Ruth made the statement that where thou goest, thou go, and where thou livest, thou live. Thy God shall be my God, and thy people shall be my people, and where thou diest, I will die also. So she made this tremendous statement that she was so close to Naomi. It's good to have a close relationship uh, with those in her family. Wouldn't you agree? I believe that's great for us to be able to have that kind of a relationship with our family and not only with our uh, immediate family but also with our church family, a fellowship one with another, uh, loving and caring and uh, praying for each other. So the Bible said uh, here as Naomi said unto her in verse 20, daughter-in-law, blessed uh, be uh, he of the Lord who hath not left off his uh, kinsmen uh, to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, uh, The man is near kin uh, unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And uh, Ruth uh, the Moabite said, uh, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep feast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. In other words, he was saying, I want you to be there to get what you need, to be able to supply your need, and uh, not to leave them because they're going to be uh, actually dropping what we would call a handful of purposes as they would uh, do this in the field, not just around the outer edges of the field where normally that's where the, uh, where the uh, uh, wheat or barley or uh, whatever it may have been, grapes at some time. But they would leave a handful of purpose. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou goest out uh, with his uh, maidens, that they meet thee not in other fields. In other words, be faithful uh, to this. You stay there. You don't need to go somewhere else, regardless of what somebody may say. Uh, somebody may tell you, well, they've got more over here, more over there. Uh, the Bible said, talking about Jesus, said in the last days they'll say, he's over here and he's over here and he's over here. And the Lord said, don't pay that any attention because he's everywhere. Amen. So the Bible said, so she kept fast uh, by the maiden of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and uh, dwelt with her mother-in-law. So we're talking about a six-week period here in that. Then he goes on in verse in chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest from thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz our kinsman, which whose maidens thou was? Behold, he not uh, with with no what uh, barley to night in the threshing floor. Now here's the first time that you see that word mentioned in the scriptures and talking about the threshing floor. Uh, Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law uh, bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and, and and drunk, drank. <clears throat> His heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay 
her down. And it came to pass in the midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaiden. I spare thee thy, thy skirt over thee, handmaiden, <coughs> for thou art a near kin, kinsman. This is the first time that Ruth has made known to Boaz the choice here was not for him. He could not make that choice. It was up to her to make the choice of the kinsman redeemer. There were two laws and two principles by which God had set up in his word. One was for the widow, that if she was to marry and her husband died and she had a brother, or he had a brother, excuse me, in order to keep his name and her firstborn of that family within the family, then his brother would uh, marry her and take her as a wife, and that child would be given in honor, in other words, of a Lemanek who had died, uh, which was uh, her father-in-law and her son, whom she had married, he would be the next of kin to the one that would we'll know as Boaz, but there was one who was closer than Boaz. And we'll see this later. When they meet at the gate of the city, that's where the judgment came. Now there's several things about this that relate to our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, our standing with the Lord, and knowing where we're going when we leave this world. Uh, you have to make preparations. If a person's going to heaven, they'll have to repent of their sins, trust Christ as their personal Savior, and be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Jesus says, you're mine, you're bought with a price. And uh, if a person rejects that, then uh, that day of judgment will come according to the book of Revelation. And uh, God will say, depart from me. Uh, you workers of iniquity. And so I say today, uh, everybody that uh, lives is not going to heaven. I pray that many, many folks will. But there are those today who uh, they don't like to hear the gospel. They don't like to hear the message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and the redemptive process and the regeneration being born again. Uh, not a flesh and blood, but by the Spirit of Almighty God. You know, Nicodemus, uh, he was confused, and he asked, uh, uh, is it possible for me to enter my mother's womb? And, of course, we know that wasn't even a logical question to ask, but Jesus made it very plain that that was not possible. But what was possible is to trust him as Lord and Savior. Well, when we get to heaven, at the gate of heaven, I believe before then, we'll know as Christians, we know now. We don't have to wait till we die to know we're going to heaven. Amen? We know that we're on our way to heaven. But for those that are lost today, and uh, you're taking a great chance on leaving this world lost, you should be concerned about your soul by looking ahead instead of looking behind. You may have been successful in everything that you've done, but you'll still have to come by the way of the cross. You'll have to come and bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and bow and let him be your kinsman redeemer. He will redeem you from the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Jesus Christ will take care of that. And so she said to her some things. She said, wash thyself. Verse 3 Therefore, and anoint thee. That's number two. Number three, and she said, get thee down uh, to the, uh, uh, excuse me, get thee down to the floor. And uh, then she makes it very plain what her position was to be whenever she presented herself and said, I want you to be my kinsman redeemer. You see that the, the uh, God, he protected the, the widow. He protected the womanhood by, by giving her the opportunity to carry the lineage of her husband who is deceased by having a child of the next of kin. 
And then he not only done that, but he also had protection for the land because under these circumstances, they were to meet at the, at, she was to go to the gate of the city. That's where they, that's where they had their meeting, you might say, with the authority of those in the town. That's where it was carried out, at the gates. Beloved, at the gates of heaven is where the meeting will take place, amen. And I want him to hear the Lord say, well done, don't you, thy faithful servant. Thank God for that today. But God gave protection to the widow, and God gave protection to the land. If you think about this for a moment, had she have taken a stranger, <clears throat> then he would have been in possession of that which it belonged to Elimelech in the beginning and unto his sons who had died, and he would step in as a stranger to take over the land. But God put a, uh, he put a, 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 a period, so to speak, right here, and, and he said, but in the, year, in the year of Jubilee, if the land had been sold or if a person had sold themselves into slavery to provide for the family, in that year of Jubilee, it will go back to the original owner. God wanted them to keep what he'd give to them. Amen. And God wants us to do the same thing today. When God gave us his grace, he wants us to extend grace to others. When God gives us love, and he did, he expects us to love others. When God became our closest friend by being our redeemer, then he expects us to reach out to the lost and the dying and tell them about Jesus Christ. What God done for you, what God done for me, that's all he wants us to do. We don't have to know the Bible. You don't have to take them down the Roman road to try to influence or impress them about what you know about the Bible. All you have to do is tell them what you know that he done for you. And think about that tonight. And if we will do that today, it'd be great when you get to heaven that if there's a bunch of people there, think about this. When you get to heaven, there's a bunch of people there waiting for you that you have helped them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and they're welcoming your coming into heaven. Amen. Now, to many today, they don't stop and think about that. They think it's the preacher and the deacons and the Sunday school teacher and the singing leaders and all these people. They're the ones that's supposed to bring them in. Well, I'm, I'll have to say you're entirely wrong tonight. For the Bible said every one of us are to be fruit bearers. Amen. We're to bring forth fruit unto righteousness sake. So that means what? Well, an apple tree produces apples, doesn't it? I believe it does. I've never seen an orange tree, an orange grow on an apple tree, and I've never seen the, the other either. But I'm saying today when we stand in, before the Lord Jesus Christ, we each one, if you're listening tonight, you need to be a, if you're saved, you need to be a fruit bearer. You need to help somebody else to find the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be a sad day when you look over heaven and there's not a soul there that you won to the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be a sad day for eternity when you think about that. So you see, we see now that Boaz is related to Elimelech Elimelech's sons died, and now Ruth has become a widow. And so she is entitled to that portion of land. And just suppose uh, that, uh, that uh, she did marry a stranger, uh, which according to the Deuteronomy, uh, that would have not been acceptable with God. But if she did, then that, that land would have fell out of the possession of that particular family. They no longer would have owned it. And so you see it's very important that she, by Naomi's help, realizes what a blessing it is that the Lord is taking care of Ruth. I'd say the Lord took care of every one of us. There's no doubt in my heart God took care of me whenever I wasn't even ready for God to take care of me. 
but he was leading me where he wanted me to be. He was molding me and trying to make me into what he wanted me to be. And the same is true of every one of us tonight. God, he took something and he made it a vessel under honor. And so as you see this here, we see that uh, the Bible tells us that uh, it was a very important decision when a person made this decision to marry a certain woman. And uh, if he were to die, then the next in kin of his brother would be responsible to take her as his wife and, uh, and she would have a child in honor of her dead husband. Now, that law doesn't exist today, uh, but God set it up this way to protect the widow and to protect the land because in the year of Jubilee, it was to go back to the original owners of the land. So let's, let's look at it here just a moment and see what he said. Now he's used this thought about the threshing floor. He's talking to us about the threshing floor and how that she came to Boaz after he had eaten, after he had drank. Jesus drank that bitter cup for you and me. He ate that night with the disciples, but he wouldn't take that cup until he said, I take it anew with my Father and your Father in heaven. Amen. So here we go. He said, now you go in, you lay down at his feet, and you clean yourself. You make sure that you get the right garment on. Well, the only way I can get the right garment and did get the right garment is to bow at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Father, forgive me, I've sinned. Make me who you want me to be. Forgive me of my sin. However you put that, God knows the heart, and he'll do the work in a person's heart. You've never done nothing too bad for God to save you. You never will do anything too bad for God to save you. You can be saved right now. You can be saved today. You can be saved this coming Sunday. God only knows the day and the hour. I don't. He does. But if he's dealing with your heart, listen to that small, still voice that's speaking on the inside. So then you see this. Well, that next brother, he, he's make, that first one is making a decision. And say that, that first brother said, no, uh, my, my other brother came in one night and he got all dressed up and he got and took off down the road. And me and my other brothers asked him, said, where you been? And he said, well, I was trying to be neighborly down the road. And, and they said, well, uh, did you go down there to see her? And uh, he said, yes, I did. And uh, he said, well, you know, if we live according to what God's told us to live, that if anything happens to you, one of us is going to have to take responsibility for your widow. And one of them brothers spoke up and said, I tell you right now, I ain't going to. Then what do you do? You go to the next one and you ask him the same question. And then if he refuses, you've got a real problem. You see where I'm coming to, where I'm going to. So we see this in the scriptures and we see that what happened here was the fact that uh, there was one closer to kin to Ruth than Boaz. And so she's setting the scene to let Boaz know that she is choosing him to be her kinsman redeemer. So when they go to the gates of the city and Ruth was to go, and she was to tell them, uh, I've asked the next of kin, and he refuses to take me as wife. Then they would call that, that man into account, and they would ask him, is it true that you have refused to take her as your wife? Are you with me? Stay with me. Then... If he said, that's true, I've already made the plans, I've already divided my land among my 
uh, among my sons, and uh, I have no other land, in, in essence, that I could divide with her. So I'm not going to take her as a wife. Then the Bible said that Ruth had the responsibility to come before him and to take the shoes off his feet. And this sounds very, very unhuman. And to spit in his face because she has shamed the dead brother by not carrying on the right that God had given to him to achieve. Think about this, how it relates to us. There's a couple of ways you could look at this. One of which, the first one should have said, I'm going to live by what God's word says, and I will accept her and take her as a wife. But he refused to do that. Am I right? Read on through this chapter. We're talking about the threshing floor. God is going to separate the tar from the wheat. And he mentions here about the corn. And so apparently that was part of this process of gathering uh, through this six-week period. So anyhow, here we are. He says, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to accept it. Well, the next in line was Boaz. And don't you think that he had a grin from ear to ear because he had fell in love with her when she was down in the field and now they're at the threshing floor and she's fixing to lay at his feet and when he wakes up and realizes that someone is at his feet and finds out that it's Ruth, there's an excitement come to him. Now, one of the things about the threshing floor is, if you recall in the book when it talks about Gideon, how that Gideon was in the valley trying to, trying to separate the wheat and the tar because he was afraid of the Mediites that would come and steal the crop, which they had not done anything with, but they just wanted the, the, the blessings of getting the harvest without any work. Well, that's the way a lot of folks are about church. They just want to go get a blessing and never want to do anything for the Lord. Are you with me? Come on, help me. Now, this is good preaching. I know it ain't popular, but it's good. And I'm saying this tonight because I believe that our nation needs to hear it. Our churches need to hear it. Everybody needs to hear this. Whenever she laid at his feet, let me tell you, there was a thrill in her and one in Boaz because she knew and he knew then that she had chosen him to be her kinsman redeemer. I want to tell you, whenever you bow your face before God Almighty and say, God, forgive me of my sins, you're in business with God. Amen. And in essence, the, in essence, the altars of our church are for the sole purpose of coming with burdens and objects and for the lost to come and be saved. But today, it's nothing more than just a decoration in our churches. People don't have a burden. They have no vision of what's going to happen. The Bible said without a vision, people perish. I'm telling you today, beloved, it's time our churches wake up, our people wake up, and realize we need to be about the Father's business. Amen. And let God be God and realize that He is our Redeemer. He is our kinsman Redeemer. So we've gone through this about the land. We've gone through it about the widows and the law. The protection uh, is there to protect the woman. Uh, she didn't have to go out looking for a stranger. She already had what she needed right there. Well, I thank God today we can have what we need in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're willing to bow at his feet. You see, down on the threshing floor, there's some things that happened there that's probably a little odd or unusual. They were laying with their feet pointed toward the threshing floor itself, and their head was looking out. Get this picture. Because she was at his feet, she was close to the thresher. And so in doing so, 
He woke up. He realized there's somebody at his feet. He looked and seen that it was Ruth, and he asked the question. She answered the question. And so they laid that way to protect that that was at his feet. Not only was the corn and the harvest of that corn at their feet, and all these men were facing outward, looking for the enemy. We're supposed to watch and to pray. Am I right? God said, don't, don't, go, don't be at ease in Zion because there's an enemy out there that'll come and he'll try to steal your harvest. Listen, he's doing that in families with children. The devil is stealing those children by some of the things that's going on in this world today. We're to lay with our feet toward the Lord Jesus Christ at his feet. We're to lay there and to pray and seek God's face and his will and let souls be saved and brought into the kingdom of God and that they would be, uh, they would come to know him, not just as Jesus, not just as the Messiah, not just as God, but the Lord thy God who became flesh and dwelt among us. And he's the one that'll do the work and protect those that lay at his feet. Amen. He was watching for the enemy. We're to watch for the enemy. We're not to go at ease and say, well, we got this and we got that and we got that. I mean, thank God for everything he has done for us. But what he wants us to do for him is even more important. This nothing for God to do what he's done. He spoke this world into existence and he spoke everything that you see. It all belonged to him anyhow. He just loaned it to us for a while while we're here. And we won't take not one thing with us when we leave. Amen. Lay at his feet, folks. Let him be the God. Let him be the watcher. Let him take care of those that are laying at his feet. And so the best place that I could say tonight is there are many times when I come by here by myself, I just get right here on this side of the altar and I get out and pray and I say, God, you know what our need is. And I can't do it without your help. I need your direction, your leadership, your guidance. And Lord, if you don't use me, there's no need in me being here. Amen. Because I'd be just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. But God wants us to do something that would bring honor to him. If he brought salvation to us, the least I can do is try to do my best to bring honor to him. Wouldn't you agree? So here the Mediites, they just come in and try to steal everything that was gathered up. And the devil comes, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 9, he said, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. Thank God for that. So here we are to threshing floor. We're looking at it. If you was to go on down and look at it, you'd see uh, she heard that there was a that's the first move. You got to realize God's got what you need. Amen. God's got what you need. Whatever it is, God's got it. If you need peace, God's got it. If you need salvation, God's got it. If you need hope, God's got it. Whatever it is, God's got it. But it's going to start at Calvary. It don't start by joining some religious outfit. It don't come by belonging to a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Holiness church, a Episcopal church. It don't come by the title of a church. It comes by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So here she is. She's laying at his feet. She's let him know that, that she is uh, wanting him to be her kinsman redeemer. So you see here, it's time of the feast and thanksgiving of God and the abundant harvest. Several of the feast days of Israel, as you look back and we've taught on this in Sunday school, talking about the feast of, the, uh, the feast of first fruits and uh, uh, even Pentecost you see, we're identified with that threshing floor. That 
threshing floor stands for more than just what it's called or what the name of it would infer. That was where that Ruth and Boaz, they came to each other in a way to where that she made the choice. He didn't make the choice. You and I had to make the choice to accept Christ. Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ, Boaz is a type of Christ. And so as you look at this and you see, she had to make the choice. You see, as the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to be that one that he invites us, but we make the choice. He invited her when he said, you stay in the field. You stay close to my handmaiden. You stay uh, close to the one that's reaping. You stay close to them and get acquainted with them. And so there's several thoughts you could have right there. You know, you think about people that's never heard the Bible, never heard the Word of God. They have no idea, no concept of what it teaches or what it means when it says this. And I've seen people in that, uh, with that attitude or that thought pattern. You see, with an understanding of the law, of the kinsman redeemer, as it applied uh, to the widow and to the scene of the threshing floor, it reminds that we are what? To move with the Lord. There's a time whenever the rest was over and God said it's time to go to work now. And they had to go into the threshing floor there to, to thresh out the tar and the wheat. And what they did, they would go on the hill, the highest point, where the, when the wind came through, it would blow the shaft away and the, and the harvest of that would fall to the ground. If you recall about Gideon, he was hiding in the valley trying to work and separate the, the, the tar and the wheat. He was trying to separate it. Wasn't very little wind, I suppose, down there, but he was trying to hide it and keep it so they couldn't come steal it. But God said, go up on the mountaintop over there. The wind's going to blow and it'll separate the tar and the wheat. I'll tell you what, when the, Jesus said the wind cometh from where and you don't know where it come from and you don't know where it's going, but you see the results of what it does. So what he's doing, the word of God will separate the tar and the wheat. It'll separate. It'll let a person see where they're at, how they stand in the presence of God Almighty. And so as you think about this, thinking about how God protected the land, God protected the widow, and now we're moving up to the place where God's showing us a very important part in the Boaz himself, who is not just a redeemer, he's going to be a kinsman redeemer. In other words, we become redeemed by the blood. Amen? We were redeemed by the blood. And so you see this. She said, Wash thyself, anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. Verse 3. And so she tells and she sees Ruth and has to tell her what she needs to do. You got to remember, she was raised down in a pagan country. You know that a lot of people just need help. A lot of people don't need judgment. They need help. They need help to find out what to do and how to do to be saved. What must I do to be saved? That was one question in the Word of God. And so we see this here on the threshing floor. And so he tells her that. There are four steps that are essential to a sinner. First, in this, wash thyself. If you and I are going to come to Christ, we're told that it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to the mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost in the book of Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. You see, that's the reason for the Lord said, as he did, as he did to Nicodemus, you may think that you're fine, 
religious men, and you are, but you need a bath, a spiritual bath. You see, that's what people need today. They need a spiritual bath. What's that? To be washed in the blood of the Lamb, washed away all of our sins, and made us anew, regenerated us. Thank God for that, aren't you? And then second, Naomi tells Ruth, to do is to anoint herself. After Ruth's first husband dies, I suppose she put on a widow's, uh, widow's garment and made no attempt to make herself attractive. But now Naomi realizes somebody is interested in her. She knows that Boaz is interested. Isn't it amazing how some people see things before other people do, huh? And then she says, anoint thee. And you see the concept of the experience here is the same as being born again. What she went through that night is the same experience that a person goes through when they come before the Lord Jesus Christ. The only difference is that we ask the Lord to wash us and make us white as snow. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16, he says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be white as snow. God washes everything away and makes us a presentable. Uh, you and I have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. A lot of people don't realize that. First John chapter 2, verse 20 tells us what you have. And you see, uh, there are people that fight against that today. I heard a, I heard a common t a, a preacher that's on. I hear him occasionally out of Texas, and he's a, uh, he's a teacher of the Bible. And he, makes this, he made this statement yesterday, I heard it. And he said, uh, there are a lot of people in a lot of churches, we get letters that they say, our preacher preaches, but he never preaches about Calvary. He never preaches about the blood, and he doesn't believe in the triune Godhead. I tell you what, they got a sinner for a preacher. They got a lost man for a preacher. You can't be saved and not believe in the triune Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You cannot be saved and born again without be believing in Calvary and the redemptive blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the infilling and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost that comes and sets up his abode within us, you cannot be saved without that. There's no other way. I hope it's been a blessing tonight. We'll pick up here next week and go on with it as we go into the threshing floor and what it means whenever Boaz looked up and seen Ruth. What a picture. The Lord seen me and he seen you just as we were. But before that, he had a heart that was desiring that we would come to him. Why do you say that, preacher? The Bible said, Jesus said, I would that none perish, but that all come to everlasting life. That's God's hope for everyone. And I hope tonight if you know him. But if you don't know him, we invite you to bow your knee. Say, God, forgive me of my sins and trust him as being your redeemer. And then you need to tell somebody. You don't need to keep it quiet. You need to tell somebody what the Lord's done for you. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to come and be with us at South Asheville Baptist Church, 32 Lee Anhurst. We'd love to have you, love to meet you, Come and visit with us, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. May God richly bless you. Our service times, 10 o'clock on Sunday morning for Bible study, and 11 o'clock for the preaching hour, 6 o'clock on Sunday night, and 7 on Wednesday night. May God bless you until we're able to meet or talk again is our prayer, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank God for you. In Jesus' name. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless it, use it according to your will, purpose, and plan. We'll thank you for all that you do, for it's in Christ's name that we do humbly pray. And God's people said,
Amen. Amen. God bless each one.